but at no stage can you see any attempt to um, get some empirical data where the argument could go wrong. Could, you know, let's get uh, a sample of reviews from the New York uh, Times Review of Books and let's see how many of them do name the translator. Let's collect all the adjectives they use to talk about the translator. Or let's collect all the translators working between 1910 and 1930 into English for Chinese verse. And let's see exactly what they did as a group. Um, the way we do cultural studies or the way we do literary studies isn't empirical in that, in that sense. It's sufficient to have an argument and to pick up the examples that help your argument, and this is the way it's proceeding. I would like to know, for example, if the whole of the corpus, the group of American translators, are really so underpaid. If not, there's something wrong. They should be doing something else, quite logically. Or, and this is what I think we saw when we applied the Bourdieu type analysis, many of them are doing this work because they get the rewards elsewhere, not as authors themselves or in the academic uh, situation. Is it true that a domesticating translation policy fits in with hegemonic cultural relations? That is, I could believe that the United States has a cultural hegemony over most of the Western and Eastern and Middle and Southern worlds, granted. Uh, but is that associated with a domesticating translation policy? I don't know if you got to the part where he criticizes the Bible translation theorist, Eugene Nider. And uh, he says, well, Nider's really gone in for domestication in a big way. You know, Nider's dynamic equivalence theory is domestication, fluency, making the Bible readily understandable to everybody. This is precisely the stuff that Newton would hate. The trouble is, Nider was translating not into English. It's translating into every other language except English, just about. Translating into all the languages, well, the Spanish, but the, the, uh, the Bible societies that have followed his precepts are translating into the languages of the jungles and the deserts. So, it doesn't make sense that uh, domestication means hegemony coming into English and doesn't mean hegemony going into other languages. This seems to be a contradiction in the work on Nida in that particular uh, case. And then the one that has most concerned me uh, in the years since this book was published, it's a, it was an important book, it is an important book. It really starts down to people talking about translation in relation to culture and society. Uh, but some of the numbers don't make a whole lot of sense. For example, this idea of a trade imbalance. I accept that the percentage of translations into English is 2 to 4 percent, nothing. That the percentage of translations into other cultures is pretty big, okay? But consider this, I need another culture, you're the other culture. I'm a little culture, I'm culture A, I've only got 10 texts a year, okay? Congratulations, you're a big culture, you're American. You've got a hundred texts a year. I'm jealous. But I'm a little culture. That's okay. Let's say that everything's equal in the world and translators here and there are going to translate 10% of the text from me to you. Okay? So 10% of my texts come into America and 10% of America's texts come to me. Okay? And this is optimistic. 10% is pretty good. How many texts have you got, America? Total of 100. Now you had 100 to start with. You get my translations, no. you get 10% of my texts, do you? That would be 101 texts. You have 101 texts, congratulations. How many texts have I got, Little Culture? 20. I've now got 20. Double. I've got double. Okay, 50% of all the books in my culture are translations. Woo, I'm happy. And Poor old America. What percentage have you got of translations? Just over 1%. Just over or just under? Just under 1%. Just under 1%. Okay. 
So you're bad because you've got just under 1% and I'm good because I've got 50%. Can you see the fallacy? The fallacy, I mean, the thing about the percentages is that you cannot compare big cultures with little cultures as if they were the same. It's just mathematics. We've done the mathematics for n cultures. It's a simple because it's just two. But if we are all cultures. We all have different uh, uh, numbers of texts to start with. It's normal. If we are a relatively small culture, we will have more translations than a very big culture. Why? Why? Because there were fewer texts to start with. Or there were more texts to start with. You can't criticize a culture for being big, can you? But this is what's happening in this misuse of statistics. Uh, two to four percent, if you do the regression analysis with all countries, two to four percent actually comes a little bit above what the United States should have, if all were all. This is what I did with that. I tested it. This is what I mean by empirical research, by the way. Uh, I got numbers from UNESCO. UNESCO numbers are really bad because the United States pulled out of UNESCO in 1984, uh, which means it wasn't the numbers for the United States were not there. So I had to pick four years, and I had to take a, an average for the four years because they're, they come from all the national libraries, and the data collection system is crazy. But anyway, I've got some numbers that sort of spoke to this. You've got, on the uh, vertical axis, you've got translations from language in thousands. Okay, uh, So you can see that there's uh, French, German, Russian, Spanish, Japanese, all colonial languages, I might add. Uh, are there. They've got a fair number of, of, of translations into them. And then the x-axis, the horizontal axis, the numbers of books published. You can see English is way out there in terms of uh, numbers of books published, but also uh, actual translations into them. English has a lot of translations into it. It just happens to be a low percentage. Did another analysis on the same set of data, 1979, 1983, whatever. Uh, here you can find at the bottom number of books published, so that's the same as before, and here the percentage of translations. And you'll find English is indeed out there at just 2 to 4%. I think I put it at 4 Okay, right up there by itself. But look, um, the other lines, the regression line, uh, has it underneath there. You can find a set of languages, the colonial languages again, post-colonial languages. Uh, which are around uh, 20% or 10 to 15%. Then you have exceptional languages like Swedish and Albanian. I've never managed to discover why Albanian scores so high. Well, there's lots of translations into Albanian, but actually very few books published in Albanian. Uh, so that helps. Okay. On that sort of analysis, on that comparative overview, English doesn't score too badly. When I was doing that study, I sometimes you set off to, to find out something. It's not neutral. I set off to dis I set out to disprove Venuti. You know, last time we met, you had to, to get a questionnaire and get the result you wanted. I mean, I only did this because I thought I could get the result I wanted. I must admit, okay, it's not not particularly neutral. But sometimes you get things coming out of of the data uh, that are more than what you expected. Uh, bottom axis here uh, X is percentages of translations in books published. So you've got uh, Albania at the top here. I don't know what happened to Sweden. Anyway. And over here, you've got um, percentages of books published in non-national languages. So the UNESCO data, I just saw it there. That's interesting. Um, in, a, in a country, you publish in the national languages, and then there are some books in the non-national languages. That would seem to indicate a degree of cultural diversity or openness or tourism industry or whatever. But it seemed to be an interesting statistic. So I saw, I just wanted to see if they, uh, if they had any, any relation uh, between them. And, and you'll see, 
English is absent in this one, actually. Uh, it didn't, didn't give me the data for English. You'll see that the, um, the axis means they do correlate. That cultures that have a lot of foreign language publications also have a lot of translations. I thought, well, that's strange, isn't it? Because you would expect that if a culture translates a lot, then it wouldn't read foreign languages. It's not true. Cultures that are particularly open translate and read foreign languages at the same time. Uh, this might uh, come back to one of the points you made there. Who discusses translations? You get some cultures, Sweden, for example. I still don't know about Albanian, but Sweden. Or the, the Nordic countries, Finland, uh, Norway, Denmark, Israel, Netherlands. Israel's not a northern country, but anyway, it's, it's there in that group. Uh, Arabic-speaking countries as well, uh, where um, knowledge of foreign languages is very high and the number of translations is high, so you have fairly broad sectors of the community that can and do discuss translations. Okay. Into English, I think we're into a different sort of set, uh, but I don't have the data for English for that particular analysis. When you pick at Venuti's arguments, the pieces start to fall away. Uh, do all these elements that he picks up coincide in Anglo-American culture? Yes, to some degree. But the statistical evidence is, is not a good piece. Uh, and there are also parts of the literary culture that are not particularly in love with invisibility, or transparency. I don't know if you've ever read any contemporary French literary criticism, cultural theory, or philosophy in English. It's incredibly hard to read. I actually enjoy reading the French rather than get through the English in many cases. Okay. This is one particular part of Anglo-American culture that remains resistant or remains foreignizing. Uh, not so with German philosophy, strangely enough. The, the German, often I, I pick up the German to understand, I mean, I pick up the English translation to understand the German text in some cases. The translators do tend to explain things and help the reader a little. But from French, not so much. The theory here from Turi, and I think I mentioned it when we dealt with descriptive studies, is that the more a culture respects the other culture. The more prestige the other culture has, the more literal the translations from that culture. So, I don't know. The United States is translating from Mexico. Well, we'd probably explain everything in that text to make it easier for the reader. But postmodern French theory, Despite everything, all the bad things they say about the French, there's still a bit of this cultural cringe there, and it is still quite resistant to literalist translations. So I, I really don't see it as occurring to the whole culture. It does depend on the relative prestige of the foreign cultures that you're dealing with. My final problem with Venuti is that he assumes that all the translators are in the same place as the culture that is consuming the text. That all American, all translators into English are in Anglo-American dom, wherever that is. I'm interested in that because I translate into English, so I'm one of them. But I haven't lived in Anglo-American dom for, I don't know, about 30 years. In fact, I'm from Australia. Where is that in Anglo-American dom? Are we there too? Or I work into European English for Brussels. Is that there as well? I mean, the status of the English language is such that half the people are, who speak it are in the United States and Britain, and then the other half are spread out all over the world, using it and translating into it as a second language in many cases, but not all cases. Uh, so I, I've got this problem that 
it's all set up as if the translations, translators were in the country, in the same place as the consumers. That is, in the language, as, as in one unified culture. It seems to me that that's not so. The translators tend to be traveling people, tend to be people who move, have moved, can move, like to move, and don't have the same view of the world as the people who are more sedentary within the culture. Venuti follows, I think, what Schleiermacher said in his famous text when he, he formulated the terms uh, domesticating, verdeutschende übersetzen, übersetzen, domesticating, and foreignizing, verfremdende übersetzen. Uh, he said, you've got this choice as a translator. This is Schleiermacher, 1813. You've got this choice. Either you domesticate or you foreignize. But you can't mix the two up. You can't mix the two up. Why? Because just as one must belong to a country, you must belong to a language, to one language or the other. And if you don't, if the translator does not decide to be in that language or the other, the translator will, I love that, schwebt haltungslos in unerfreulicher Mitte. The Germans will like that too. Okay. You get, you wander around, you're untethered, you're free, you're lost, you're like a drunken, drunken boat in Rimbaud's imagery. Uh, in the unhappy middle ground. That's what Lefebvre translated it as, or an unhappy middle ground. The middle ground is a horrible, nasty place to be in. And Venuti doesn't want to put anybody in that middle ground either. He wants you within American culture as an agent provocateur, as, as, as somebody who can use language differently to change the culture from the position of translation. It seems to me that most translators are not in that position, are not that centrally located within the cultures. That many of us are working and moving in that supposedly unhappy middle ground. But I quite like that middle ground. That middle ground is excluded in all these pairs that we saw earlier on. All this set of theories, and I put Venuti in there too, because they are all theories of home and away, this and the other, with us or against us. If you're not with me, you're against me, as Marxists have often wanted to say. Personally, as a translator and as somebody who works on translation, I don't feel identified with that culture. I don't feel sympathy for that culture. I don't feel responsibility for that culture. I think, though, that we could look at Venuti's call for, to action with interest. Not in its global social setting, because we're not all there, but as something that might operate on a more individualistic level. I think it's true for us as professionals, within our own professional network, that if we efface ourselves, if we don't talk with the clients, if we don't get our name on the front cover, if we don't put in the notes, put in the translator's preface, if we don't manifest our presence through all available means, we will not be appreciated, we will not be paid, we will not get any kind of capital. But that doesn't, for me, have major ramifications for the shape of culture in the United States, or in Britain, or in Australia, or in Europe, or anywhere else.